So first of all, Jose Andres, congratulations on your podcast. I started listening to your podcast <laughs> with uh, Eric Ripper, and then you know, and and I, you are for always for me the person, the big personality that can bring a message across personally as well to the world. So I'm so happy to be on your podcast. Um, I'm so happy, obviously, because this is an excuse uh, to listen to you, to be with you. You and I, we have not spent huge amounts of hours together. But every time we've been together, um, I always felt something special, peaceful, enlightening. Listen to your voice, your amazing whispering, listening to your, your voice speak through your cello. <laughs> it's fascinating. And you know, and having you here is use. Yes, I have a crush on Jojo Ma, people. I do have a crush on Jojo Ma. And I am a fanboy of Jose Andres. <laughs> and you know what? I'm a fanboy of your whole family because it was only after I met, you know, there are larger than life personalities uh, uh, many places. But when you meet their families, sometimes that changes. But what was amazing was when I met your family and I see the care that they have for you and you for them, for your wife and your daughters, um, I see a complete human being who is both incredibly active in the world, but also a real person and family man who is beloved by his family members. That's unusual. Well, and yeah, we have family members that they share share us uh, with others, with causes. My wife says that uh, she knows how much I love her, but that I love my cookbooks. I have cookbooks from 1600s, 1700s. And for me, a happy moment is being in my kitchen with one of those cookbooks that they are so old that you can smell it. And it's almost like the book is talking to you. And I love to be in the kitchen with those books, sometimes alone. And trying to have a conversation with a book that has a lot to tell me because it's centuries old and has secrets of the past. I'm guessing that for the ones uh, of you may not know, I, I did that on his introduction, that you go everywhere with your amazing cello, which if I'm right is from the 1700s, 1733. And I see the same way I travel sometimes with my 1600s cookbooks, that in a way... <laughs> I love that you and I, we share this, you with music through your instrument, me with food through my cookbooks. My cookbooks, in a way, they are part of who I am. They are alive. Obviously, my wife and my children and my friends. But the books are those silent friends I have next to me. Is, is, you, is your cello your silent friend, even obviously it's not silent when you began playing the notes? Well, you know, there's so many commonalities between cooking and the, the idea of eating, making your food, and making sound of, in music. And I, I think uh, the answer is absolutely, but there are some differences. The first thing that I'd like to say is that when I hear you talk, you bring me into the sensual, tactile world through words. That's amazing because you use words uh, to show what you think 
uh, analytically, to show me how you feel, uh, whether it's with a cookbook from 1600 or me with a cello from 1733 or playing music from the 1800s. Uh, but you bring us all to the present. So between working with your head, your heart, and your hand, you make us see and feel and experience all of that. That's what I try to do in music. And what I love even more about this gigantic way that you have to bring something that when you talk about it, you make me feel and smell and taste what you are saying. And I try to do that through sound is to get people to feel and to smell and to taste and to touch and to go inside someone's soul. But the thing that I think I admire about you so much is, okay, you have this talent. On your podcast with Eric Ripper, you say, I'm a good cook. I'm a really good cook. And which is absolutely true. But then my question is, what do you do with it? And what I see that you've done with what is your passion is not only cooking, but it's the sharing of everything that you know. And you so recently you were in the Ukraine. Uh, I know some people who worked for you there. Uh, you know, I, I see what you're doing. We shared a common experience that I will never forget in Puerto Rico and San Juan. And I would love to for us to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about um, that. But you, yeah. you mentioned that with Eric Ripper, they said, yes, I, I, love, I love to cook and I take pride like many chefs that we are good in our profession. Uh, I began helping my mom um, and my dad in the kitchen probably since I have memory, three, four, five years old. But I'm sure I was making a mess and obviously I couldn't cook on my own. Jojo, when you were three years old, you were already playing violin and piano. By the time you were four, you decided you used to play cello and you began just playing in front of people. How, how that come to be? You, you are four and I can barely break an egg in my profession. And in your profession, you are already this beyond talented four years old. I don't know, little boy, fascinating. It's because your father being a musician and your mom being obviously a, a, a singer and, and the DNA and the passion that your mother, your father had to be putting into you growing up uh, uh, in Paris. It's fascinating to me that a guy like me at four, I, we, I will not able to feed myself and only make a mess. And somebody like you will be a total prodigy in one thing, which is playing notes in an amazing way with the help of an instrument. What, what memories, if any, you have of those moments being so young and having an instrument that was three times bigger than you? Well, I think in the same way that you were helping your mom at age four, and you say that you couldn't break an egg, That's nonsense. Of course you could. I have grandchildren who are trying to help my daughter uh, to cook. And are they really doing it? Maybe, maybe not. But the point is, you are surrounded by food every day. And your mother's cooking and you're helping her. I was surrounded by music. My mother sang. My father was teaching me music. My sister, my older sister, played violin. And so music was always around the house. And it was not like I was particularly good at one thing or another, but it was it was the food around the house were the sounds. And so I naturally absorbed what was there. I didn't think I was particularly good. And I probably still don't think I am particularly good. I think there are many people who are better than I am in many parts of music. But that's really not what we're talking about, is it? We're talking about 
what you try to do with what you have. On one of your podcasts, you were saying, oh, pasta. Well, you know, everybody <laughs> everybody knows that pasta was invented in Spain. <laughs> and I'm laughing. He says, ah, uh-huh. there it goes, Jose Andres. And, says, and then you look at the package and says, oh, it's made in Italy. But still, you know, pasta, <laughs> Spain, you know. And so the point is, you know where the pasta comes from, but that doesn't. If that's not the point. The point is you love the pasta and you love the quality of the pasta. And I don't think I'm particularly the best at anything. There are people who can play better, more accurately, who know more than I do. But all I can do is put together what I have, what I am. And as a four-year-old, I had Chinese parents who were very pushy. They were very, they were very, uh, you know, they were tiger parents. They wanted their children to be somehow somebody. And so I was pushed hard to do music. I loved music, but I never said I love the profession until much later on. I loved fellow musicians as I grew up. But that didn't make me want to become a musician. I just loved playing with them. <laughs> so there must be a difference between loving to cook and also and loving to play your profession and your mission. Yeah, and I think there's a difference. And I think I think I would love to know how you think the difference is. And I'd love to talk to you about what what I've been trying to to struggle with in myself. What what it means just to do music because music as with food is all around us it's what keeps us alive the the ingredients so, the ingredients are the notes and when you put the ingredients together yes. you create symphonies the dishes when you put the notes together with the rhythm you create um, amazing plays that can be traditional can be modern can be but you are creating magic out of putting those notes and the moment you are creating it. You know, when I realized your passion, obviously uh, I knew you in the distance, like many of us, by listening you talk, by listening you play. Uh, but I, ha- I got the opportunity I could meet you. A few years ago, was an event happening in Washington, D.C. at the Smithsonian. And I was coming from somewhere uh, in a mission with Wall Central Kitchen. But I was making it for two reasons. A, I was one of the speakers in that event, which actually was a fascinating event. If you remember, that uh, was I many did. of us that we kept interviewing each other in a rotation nonstop. And I knew that if I made it on time, uh, you were taking a plane that night. It was a be- beautiful, slightly rainy getting into the fall, September, October, Washington, D.C. And, 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 and I was arriving and you were leaving. So I didn't make it because you were about to be performing. And I want to see you live performing your cello in D.C. But I didn't make it. And I just caught you right as you were leaving. And I was coming in into that building. And this is the moment... I met you, you gave me a hug, I give you a hug, and I told you, man, I was coming to listen to you play live. I missed my opportunity. I hope it'll be next time. And in that moment, you did something that it showed me that you are still that three, four-year-old little kid that loves to play more than being a musician loves to make others happy, loves used to, to be in the moment and enjoy the moment. You remember what happened in that moment after we hug each other and I told you, I, I miss you. I, I, I cannot believe I didn't see you, but next time I will see you live. You remember what you did for me that night, course, that moment? Of course, I took, out, I took out my cello and I played a little piece for you. And that's Outside, the piece. In the rain. Next to the rain, 
you play one piece, you follow with another, and then you had to go because you were losing your playing. And in a way, this is what I try to do with cooking. That the best way I have to express love and respect to others is use doing the only thing I know, is grabbing some ingredients and grabbing my knife and heat up the pan and cook something. This to me is a fascinating moment because it's a true moment. And forever I carry that video in my phone. It's like, you know who play one day under the rain for me alone? And for me, that was a happy moment and show me that sometimes we don't have to do much to give and show love to others. That moment you show me what giving love to others meant. And for me, what the expression of that love happened when we went uh, after a number of events in Puerto Rico where I heard you talk. I heard uh, Luis Miranda talk. We went to three farms one day. Do you remember that? We to, have to, you, to have you in Puerto Rico was unbelievable. I was going to be touching this a little bit later. But, okay, uh, go. Okay, but the Puerto Rico was amazing. Uh, and this is who my friend, Jojo Mai's people, um, in uh, Ukraine, we were having a hard time. We just got one kitchen bombed in Kharkiv. We got four wounded, four women chefs wounded. Thanks God, nothing happened at the moment. And I pick up the, the phone and I texted no other than Jojo. And I say, Jojo Ma, can you, can you play a song and to share with the five, 6,000 team members of Ukraine? And I don't know, within, <laughs> I would say within a, an hour, because, you know, the hour, six hours differential with America, I don't know even where he was. He sent me no one, but two videos, uh, two videos performing cello and giving a beautiful speech. And for that, I thank you because we shared that through social media internally. I even know President Zelensky listened to it. Uh, this is, this is who you are. Um, I've seen a lot of moments like you, uh, Jojo. Uh, you, you, you bring people together, longer tables through your cello. You also, you have a beautiful, peaceful way to protest with your cello, like when you perform in front of, of the Russian embassy without calling anybody. You, you did it out of heart, sending a message of peace and hopefully love. Uh, but uh, I remember this moment... Uh, uh, I think you got your second dose of of COVID, and, and you you play obviously the cello anywhere, anytime. Um, and you play the Ave Maria. Why, why? Tell me about that moment. The second dose of the COVID vaccine. You take your cello. You play the Ave Maria. Why? Why you play the Ave Maria? And, and why you felt after getting the second dose that you had to use be performing right there. Well, you know, it's funny because we could spend the rest of the podcast saying nice things about one another, <laughs> which is very nice. But I, I also want to say that that when you you know when we were getting the vaccine, first of all, a million people died in the United States, over a million people, and and I know statistics we lose track after a certain number, but still it's a big number and people were being protected by the scientists that have made the vaccine, accelerated it because of great invention and what was great at the site in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, uh, a town where the people that were administering the vaccines were volunteers, were doctors who took out of their own time, decided that, you know, they were going to help. And other people who were teachers that I recognize from, from, you know, uh, community members. This is it for me, it was like the best version of what we can be. The best version of what we can be is when people who have the goods 
share it, who have the skills, share it with those who need it. And, and, you know, I was, I, one of my favorite stories is, is a children's book called Stone Soup. I don't know if you know that book, but basically it's a book where a village has nothing to eat. But then someone says, okay, well, I have some, you know, something I can bring. They start a fire and gradually everybody brings something and then they have a meal. And this, what you do, what I try to do is sort of like, is a completion of what is needed. You always go to places, you know, in Puerto Rico after Hurricane uh, Mary, you fed, I think, what is it, three and a half million people. And and again, it's it's not about numbers, but it's about inspiring people to collectively do something that is worthwhile, meaningful, and needed. Now, music, you could say, is more ephemeral than food. But I would say that all of us are also spiritual beings. So while Ukraine and Russia are fighting, uh, you know, a senseless war, uh, I don't want to get into the politics. I just want to actually acknowledge that these are, they're human beings who have living, breathing brains and hearts and thinking and loving, but somehow are suffering on both sides. And, and, you know, so you feed people with food and I try and do whatever I do in music. Um, and you know something, but I, I have to say something uh, that I know is true in my head, which is that you make the food. Actually, you cause the food to be made because you don't make all the food, but you take from nature the food that is necessary to feed people. So we're all creatures of nature. But the difference between you and me is that you basically make the food and I'm the waiter. <laughs> well, I'm the waiter. I don't, make, I don't make the music. You know what? I work from the World Central Kitchen <laughs> as a waiter because, wait a minute, I'm, but I'm also a very important person. You see, socially you might say, oh, the waiter is nothing. But I take pride in being a waiter because... I'm there to make sure that the experience of the person who is eating the food is going to be a great one. Well, you are the soundtrack so, of you are the soundtrack of our lives. For me, it was so amazing uh, through the years and listening to some of my favorite uh, soundtracks, especially of movies. Seeing how you were. Uh, with notes and behind and part of like Ennio Morricone once upon a time in America and the mission, the mission is probably one of my favorite movies of all time for a lot of things. And there I, I can hear you. I can, I can realize that all of a sudden the cello I'm listening to is of Yo-Yo Ma himself. So you see, I'm maybe in the kitchen cooking and I'm putting the mission, which I play very often. Uh, and there, one day, because you want to learn more about everything, and you realize, oh, look at who was as part of this soundtrack, which to me is fascinating. Uh, and this brings also to moments that are special to us and memories. So you you growing up in, in Paris, Chinese parents, musicians. I mean, Paris is, with permission of many other great cities around the world, Paris has been food capital of the world. What memories you have growing up, if any, in Paris? Well, uh, the baked I, bread? Uh, were, were you cooking, were your fa parents cooking Chinese or were they cooking French? T tell me those memories that you may have. They were, they were cooking both. And what I love still about France, I mean, you go, the, well, speaking of the way you talk, you walk on the street, you you pass by a boulangerie, patisserie, you know, in the morning, and the smell of 
French bread and of, of just coming out of the store is irresistible. And you, you, you know, you go in and you eat a hot croissant that's just come out of the oven. It's, it's the most delicious thing in the world. And you know what? When I, I lived close to the Luxembourg Gardens uh, in the Latin Quarter, um, and and one of the greatest treats when ice cream, which was relatively new. So the taste of ice cream, of vanilla ice cream, it's not the vanilla ice cream that we get here in stores generally, but the vanilla bean, the Madagascar bean, that is so, I mean, I can still taste it in my mouth today. You know, like on the little cone, a four-year-old tasting that ice cream, it's that, that memory is totally there. I mean, it's like comes back instantaneously. And you know what? My parents, French people, used to eat everything, right? All parts of an animal, right? Here, we only use it in hot dogs <laughs> or whatever. But the fact is, nothing's wasted. Right. So kidneys, you know, liver, brain, uh, you know, I love I love those parts. There are some of my favorite yeah. parts. I grew up e Same eating here. the little brains of the rabbits or of the lambs. And I'm sorry, people, it's not disgusting. It's like eating a cloud. That's maybe is why the brain is up in our body, because technically it's like a cloud. You put the brains, as my mom will do, is lightly fried on egg wash, that you grab it and it's almost so light. Oh my God, I have, I have yeah. dreams of those, those parts that nobody wanted, but that my mother and my father will buy and will always create amazing dishes. See, Jose Andres, you're making me salivate as, as you talk, because, I, I, but I, I want to say that one of the things that I try to do in music is to make sure it's like almost an electrical connection that whatever I do is what it, for me success means it's not that someone is in a seat in a hall listening that's not it it's that something is transferred from deep inside me uh, to deep inside someone else and whatever is delivered is absorbed, received, lived with and passed on to something else. If that happens, this is a live connection. It's part of food. It becomes part of what keeps us alive. And, and I think that um, the breakdown of the connections in the food chain So if I go to the supermarket and buy, you know, 93% uh, uh, you know, uh, fat-free beef packaged, I don't think of a cow. But I think the way you describe, you know, the flavor, the taste, it's it brings me back to what indigenous people do. They also eat animals but with not in excess, but with respect, right? So yep. it's like, yes, I would love to be a vegetarian, but I'm not. So I now think so much more about, like, I try not to eat. I love octopus. But I also saw the movie. Ooh, it's going to be a lot of I, people <laughs> are going to be screaming but, at you and I, but... Yeah, fact, I like no, octopus no, too. At least, right. So I try, it's one of our favorite foods. And I know in Spanish cooking, forget it. It's like, you know, and, and, um, I, but it's what do we do if we need to be part of the food chain, but also to try and do it with respect, right? And, you know, in, in indigenous cultures, you thank the animal, you thank, or people say grace. In, you know, there's an acknowledgement of 
a sacrifice that's been made so that we live. And this is what happens over and over again. It happens in parenting, in grandparenting. It happens with teachers. It happens with our frontline workers. It happens. People are sacrificing themselves to do something. And it's not just about transaction. It's not about, oh, you're a great chef, so you get paid a lot of money, and then you, and that's it. No, you're a living human being that's trying to do something that's worthwhile. And it goes beyond the normal transactions of which we need. But there's more to that. And that part is what I call culture. It's, it's the science part. It's the spiritual part. It's the meaning part. It's the part that feeds our soul that we need to appreciate in order to respectfully move on in society. And, and respect is what you, you show very often every time you show up somewhere around the world. I saw that uh, in first person when you came in the aftermath of Maria, we were mentioning before, to Puerto Rico. And you spent, uh, you did a lot of things in Puerto Rico. But I'm very thankful for the time you spent with us, with the teams of World Central Kitchen. And if you remember, we went to different farms, uh, different oh, farms. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Uh, you're going to, I, I want to hear what you remember and the other things you were doing about Puerto Rico. But people, what he did was going to farms where people that lost everything, uh, they were able to be back and start producing cheese again and fruits again and vegetables again and yuca. And the island is slowly but surely uh, with hard work was trying to come back to be, to be normal again. And Jojo will get, like he always does, he will come to some of those communities, open up his cello, and he will begin bringing joy by playing amazing music. That was, for me, an amazing experience. But tell me what you remember about, about that and everything else you were doing around Puerto Rico. I remember two of the three farms that we went to. Um, one was a young couple who decided this is part of your plow to plow to share uh, plow to um, program plow to plate program right that World Central Kitchen does plow to share and uh, to plate rather plow to plate, plow to plate. Farm to, yeah farm to table plow to plate and um, so this young couple who uh, started this farm which you supported and they started growing uh, high end so many different types of foods and herbs and flowers uh, trying to actually get out of the idea that Puerto Rico has to import so much of their food right? That somehow, that actually, it's a, such a land rich country, I mean, um, place that doesn't need to import all of their foods. And, and that these people are trying to make a go at, at supplying uh, restaurants, local restaurants with high end produce and herbs and whatever they, they might need so that that they don't need to import is, is that correct that's that's one of the places yes sir and uh and another place and i this i talk to people all the time you went to a community it was in Mex mexico city or something it was uh it was in one place that was actually fairly challenged location uh, uh and it was, well, let's put it this way. I had to go to the bathroom uh, there visiting a garden and someone had to take me through three sets of locked doors to get to a bathroom. So this was a gated community, uh, not because of too much wealth, but because of safety. And everything was locked up except for the garden. And we went to this garden, which you supported, 
And that place, I, again, I may be out not mem- remembering correctly, but, but what I remember was that it was so beautifully tended, so gorgeously kind of uh, the cultivated, the, it was flowers, plants, and there was nothing guarding it. It was so, within in a community where it where things were not safe. You created a place that everybody wanted that little plot to, to be thrive and safe. to survive and to be yeah. beautiful because it was not only helping feed in a way the community physically, but also in a way was feeding the community philosophically and spiritual, in a spiritual yeah. way. Uh, yeah. People and, want beauty. People want to feel like there is hope at the end of the horizon. And I think in a way that's, that's what that farm garden represented. And I'm so happy you remember that and you, uh, and, and you, caught, you caught that. Uh, but you have to feel very amazing, not only playing in the best concert halls of the world, that obviously is maybe where your music sound best, uh, but putting yourself in the middle of nowhere and being yourself and just letting people that maybe will never have access to masters like you to be able to incorporate your music into their lives in a way that is going to remain with them forever. That's what you do. Not when you came with us to the with World Central Kitchen, Puerto Rico and other places, but when you, you've been doing this all, all your life, going to communities used to bring a sign of respect only by you playing your cello. Well, you know, I think you touched on one word that I think uh, we both try to think a lot about, which is access. So for people who don't have access to nourishment, to good food, you have some of the great restaurants of the world. And, and what you choose to spend your time, you know, you're kind of like, um, you're kind of like a Robin Hood that tries to take from what you, <laughs> but you're a one man Robin Hood. I you know, uh, no, but listen <laughs> to me. Uh, well, I, I uh, during the pandemic. And then you try to feed people. During the but well, but we all try to feed each other, and feeding is beyond food. Uh, we try to feed happiness, feed comfort, feed feed uh, uh, nurturing of the soul, feed music, feed stories, feed hope. We are all, and we should all be in the business of feeding each other. Uh, I think we are all in the feeding business. And you, you fed me and you fed many in a very amazing way during the pandemic. Uh, I remember with my daughters, we began cooking. And because now we have social media, we put some music, we cook with the music, and we share what we were cooking in real time trying to make a moment of fun in a moment of darkness. You got your cello and began playing and began putting it and posting it with after you will give a speech about hope and, and just you began playing. And, and this became what was the Songs of Comfort project. And you went viral. And I have a feeling many other musicians and and, and music groups began doing the same because you, you began in the early days of the pandemic doing this. So tell me, what was the moment that you decided to do the, the Songs of Comfort project? You just happened. You were, you were at home and you, you began playing and sharing that love with everybody. Well, you know, it's, it's, this takes us, I think, to, um, I think, the next subject, which is, what people can do 
when we worked together. I was, this was like three days after the shutdown in March of 2020. And I was in our office uh, with my three colleagues uh, and Jonathan, Ben, and Sophie. And we, we were facing the reality that <laughs> there were not going to be public concerts. And we had the, this office and we said, what should we do? I think Jonathan was the one who says, you know, songs of comfort. And we said, okay, we used to kind of do things from our office for, you know, in, in a way, disaster relief, you know, when Fukushima happened or when different disasters, we, you know, we'd send a message or something. So basically we said, okay, we may have to shut down the office, but before we do that, let's just, uh, I had my cello with me and said, let's just do a number of these so we could set, send them off. And, uh, and that's how it started. But I think, as in a lot of uh, things that happen when there's a need, probably a lot of people were thinking about this at the same time. And this is the subject about colleagues, sector, not doing something alone. You know, this idea didn't just come from me. I think it came from a lot of people and spontaneously or 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 in connection with a lot of that happened look in italy people were singing in balconies right you know this this happened in in england people were banging on pots and pans and celebrating every thursday the the first um, you know uh, 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 frontline workers i mean there was this outpouring of communality across the world and spontaneous in, in many ways yeah but in the chefing part you have uh so i know you're very good friends with eric ribert and 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 um and who's your friend from uh from bologna uh ah, massimo votura the italian chef massimo votura yeah right so so here is what you do. And, and I, for me, one thing happened in, uh, I was with uh, the artist JR, and we went to the Paris Refettorio. And I think maybe the most memorable meal I've ever had was when a number of Parisian chefs decided to take food that was not going to be, you know, be thrown away and take these ingredients and cook. And this is underneath the church, Madeleine Church. Yep. And, uh, and I went there uh, and, and basically three things happened. Chefs cooked, mealtime, homeless people came, and basically citizens volunteers would serve the meal and afterwards we would eat together so basically i went with a number of people uh we carry you know my job as a waiter right i carry the food mm -hmm. pour water take it to different people and ask people you know is this is this enough would you like more whatever and and then afterwards i think maybe i played something for them um and then i uh, and then we, we sat down together. To this day, there was one lady who had not spoken a word for several years, uh, but when she heard music, it jogged something in her mind that she was a singer. And she started, uh, that night, she, she wouldn't stop. She would sing, sing, sing. And to this day, I hear that she's still doing that. So the effect of, you know, of service, of some kind of communal thing that where, for me, the best way to have a meal is to have sort of like a level playing field, you know, we're all in one 
place and we're doing it for one another. And there's, you know, it's, it's the simplest thing, uh, but sometimes hard to achieve in a very hierarchical, complex world that we live in. But I see you try to do that over and over mm-hmm. again. Your friend Eric tries to do that with getting tons and tons of, of food that are being thrown away, trucked to a, to a, a yep. place in, I think, in New York. And then they, they've now succeeded in creating dinners for under $5 that get distributed by hand to places that are most difficult to reach. And, and I see chefs doing this. And this is the sectorial influence that you have. You know, I think maybe you didn't start it. Maybe it started with a lot of people at the same time. But you follow but what others did before you and you try to make it better yeah, and make sure it, that keeps growing. Totally. It's the this, cumulative yeah, it's the cumulative energy that people say. So one of the people that work at the BSO, uh, uh, Chris Rigomez, and and he uh, during the pandemic he said, you know, I'm going to go volunteer for World Central Kitchen. So he went and and he came back and said this is one of <laughs> the the top experiences he's ever had and and that's that's incredible you know uh, i have a friend who's the principal cello of the boston symphony les desjardins you know he's a baker he's like a almost he's a professional baker he's principal cello and we're involved in thinking about community and next year we'll probably do food and music in some way that makes I'm, sense. I'm game. I'm game. Like I, I, yeah, heard, so, I heard your wife was also baking during the pandemic. Uh, yes, absolutely. But I she, want to ask you something. Everybody was baking. I love... So you... I mean... Your wife baking during the pandemic ahead. had to bring you memories connecting to your childhood on the bakeries in Paris in a very fascinating way. Ab- absolutely. The baking and the cooking and the sharing of recipes for my my children, uh, all of them, they're always on the phone talking about food and trying something new and trying each other's recipes and talking about what happened and describing. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's a community of people who, who are, deeply engaged in something that is meaningful to them. So, so yo, yo, I, I get, I get comfort when I cook. Uh, and I said before, I may put music sometimes very different melodies. Uh, sometimes can be cold play. Sometimes can be uh, a piece you play. Sometimes can be uh, any Morricone, but I love to cook with music and sometimes in solitude. So yes, for me, food is a way to comfort others. But many, very often, sometimes it's a way that I comfort myself. When you play the cello, does you playing the cello alone in the solitude of whatever place you are brings you also kind of comfort and it's a moment of of trying to re regroup within yourself, trying to understand what, what what who you are and what else can you be. Uh, how how is your relationship with the cello in those moments that you are one on one with it? Well, it's 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 almost exactly as when I perform because it's taking it's going to the most intimate part of yourself and and uh, and getting to a state of mind that you would like to be in or that the music could take you into that state of mind. But music is a state of mind. It's it's like a magic pill that if you want to feel a certain way, that music will actually get you to that parallel state. And for me, uh, music is it's maybe the most intimate thing that I do. Uh, and so, yes, it does give me comfort. Uh, it didn't used to because I, I was trained to perform, but now I realize this is, you know, I'm the player, but I'm also the listener. 
<laughs> so you know, I can comfort myself if I if I need to, uh, because that's um, you know that's that's who I am. Um, so here in this show, uh, yeah. ask me. I'm ready. I'm all ears. Okay. So so I want to say this on this show because you are to me a role model on how to be. And I truly want to do more with you. And not just when we meet, but I would love to find a way where we can do some of these things together. And uh, not as in, you know, you cook and I play, but, but some of the places that you go to or some of the places that I go to, I'm trying to go to national parks. I'm trying to think that, you know, we're part of nature. So going outside of concert halls and going to places where you're actually activating people uh, by bringing them together when they may not meet yeah. generally yeah, at but all. But, Jojo, you are talking like uh, if this is a new idea. You've been doing this, my friend, all your life you are only keep bringing new people to it and i'm i'm so humble that you are asking me to to join you when you've been doing this uh forever i mean can you tell me about you know you play cello with the kalahari bushman you you learn about them like in your times when you were at harvard in cambridge uh, almost 20 years before so you are like me once you get an idea you make sure that that happens so when you did that, was trying to bring different people together, trying to to bring issues forward. Uh, use, uh, I think you you created what was called the Silk Road Ensemble, and you will go to different communities precisely around the world, like to visit the Kalahari Bushman, and was a way for you precisely to bring. Um, you know, uh, awareness to issues, awareness to people that were forgotten, and in the process, bringing people together. Tell me, tell us a little bit about about what was these the Silk Road assemble, what what you were trying really to achieve. Well, Silk Road, which is what it is called today, uh, is I is, and I it, it, the the simple idea is about. Uh, going from a historical place where you say pasta started in Spain, uh, <laughs> I'm saying that pasta probably started everywhere. and Or it didn't matter where it started, but in fact, whether it's pasta or dumplings or the lute or the oud, or different instruments, or the guitar, to the sitar, to the tar, to the dutar, or to, you know, all the instruments that we have today are descendants of older instruments that came from different places. This is the same thing with food, with spices, with materials, with metals, with ideas, with religions, <laughs> you know, you name it. Uh, it's you dig deep enough into any one place in the world, you actually find the world. You know, there are many poets who have said that. Rumi said that, and we know that. And so today, we're looking at at the present, sort of at a one flat line in politics, in economics. It's sort of saying this is a country. This is what. But actually, if you go deep in time. You have many, many different worlds, and acknowledging that is acknowledging the dignity of every individual, any place in the world, because whether they're rich today or not, at different times, they were actually part of many different things. I think that's because we have a crisis in People sort of saying this is identity, this is ethnicity, but we also at the same time 
through scholarship, through science, doing deep historical work, we're finding new things about ourselves every single day. And, and I think, speaking of access, we want people to have that access because uh, that's what brings us together more deeply and more truthfully. And, and so we're not taking away any truths that are being said today, right now. But to have that knowledge actually acknowledges um, our deeper humanity of what connects us. That was the idea of the project. So, you know, today someone else is running it, Rhiannon Giddens, who's a phenomenal singer and songwriter and thinker. And she is actually taking Silk Road to looking at all the peoples that built the American Railroad. And you think about what, what it takes to build a railroad and, and the populations that have built it, that have been through it, whether it's, you know, um, African Americans and Chinese and indigenous people, all the people that are involved in the construction of and the lands that the railroads actually brought what to the world. I mean, so it's a. It's I, a, I have a, a restaurant that, in a way, happened because that, because it was the many Chinese Asians that came to help build a railroad in California. Many of them, as yep. that project was finished, moved to Mexico. That's mm -hmm. life, and that's humans. Um, in Mexico, is one moment they wanted to send the Asians and the Chinese back uh, outside the country. Some of them stay in Mexico and they created a community in the desert called Mexicali, where you have many thousands of people that they are Chinese descent and where you can be having their tacos and guacamole with traditional uh, lo mein and Chinese food. And I opened a restaurant called China Poblano, which I put together the Asian Chinese influence with the Mexican dishes into one restaurant. So even has nothing to do directly, indirectly, obviously, I opened these restaurants because the railroad. So it's kind of funny. Uh, That's you fantastic. I love that. I love that. It's funny. I have another. So I'll tell you another story. I have a wonderful friend who is a Cuban musician. He's a classical and jazz clarinet and saxophone player, Paquito de Rivera. I don't know if you've heard of him. Paquito, very, very well. A legend. A, yes, a, he's a great Cubano. And, and so he and I uh, became friends when we were working on Brazilian music and we played a lot of Torinos together. And, and, but he used to say on the Upper West Side in Manhattan were these Cuban Chinese restaurants. And he said, I'll tell you why, because when I was growing up in Havana, there was a big Chinese population in Havana, and I used to go into this building where there were all these, you know, Chinese people eating, and, 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 and lots of, the, all the community came to, to this building, and so he was fascinated, and he said, you know, he started calling me, uh, he started calling him and me rice and beans. He said, I'm going to write a piece for the two of us called the Rice and Beans Concerto. So he calls himself Beans, I call myself Rice, and we just premiered it in Washington, D.C. at Wolf Trap and, and called The Journey, and it was amazing. And with a wonderful Erhu player, um, um, Kathy Yang, and, um, and so there's so much of that that goes on. Then in Mexico City, um, ever been to Cochimilco, you know, the, the lake where Amazing. the Aztec, so yep. people are now planting and then taking it to, to restaurants in, in, in Mexico, high end restaurants. So there's this, you know, kind of like indigenous, uh, uh, foods being brought into current cooking in, in Lima, where I visited in Mexico city. So we tried to do this food and music in all these different places and in in uh, in uh, the Smokies just now bringing African American cooking and indigenous cooking to the fore because 
that's also a tradition that's not as um, as mm. known. And we're you know it's it's just great to kind of bring that music and the food together in a way that celebrates what is in every local area. Yep, and you mentioned before JR that I I fall that I didn't mention that JR is uh, this French artist that he does things around the world like Jojo uh, Madas and he's done things like creating this amazing in the southern border between the US and Mexico this long table with the photo of the eyes of a refugee child transformed into a table that went over the fence on both sides and where a, a lunch was served of people eating on both sides of the wall, of the fence, uh, showing how creativity, art, food can always uh, play together, as you, Jojo, are mentioning. And, and it's funny because I've seen you more times playing out in nature than I've seen you playing inside a concert hall. And this, I'm guessing that you are not afraid of playing in the open. And I have a feeling you even believe that your cello plays better, uh, not, not in the perfect sound proven concert hall, but almost in the nature with the, with whatever are the noises, uh, good or bad ones, but the noises of life itself. Uh, and, and I know you've been working on these, um, uh, new project of yours that you call the natural world, uh, and has a lot to do with this new recording you have out, which is the, uh, as you spend a lot of time, uh, uh, studying back and playing back, even is what brought you to Puerto Rico. Now you've been dedicating the time uh, to Beethoven and you have this new recording, uh, the sixth symphony, the, the, the pastoral symphony. Uh, but instead for entire orchestra, you, you've done it for a trio. Uh, and, and, and this has a lot to do with this project of you, the natural world, being in the outside. You like to play in the outside. I'm guessing you love the outside world more than you like to be in the comfort of your four walls of your home. Well, I think I, I, I do love the outside world. And, and I think, you know, when I have a one-year-old granddaughter... And when she is fussy, and when she gets, you know, uh, when she's not happy, if we take her outside, almost immediately, she calms down. Because there's something about her feeling the air, the motion of, you know, just slight movement of air and the sound outside. There are things that we take for granted that, you know, inside, outside, oh, it's the same, but it's not. And, and to be aware of that and to, and to be part of that, I think is part of what, um, can make us feel more whole. You know, the Japanese have a saying about forest, about being in the woods. They call it forest bathing. You walk into the wow. woods and they actually say, this is, it kind of cleanses your your soul in some way. And I believe that. I think, you know, if I walk in the woods in, in, in the country, I'm in a different world. If I go, you know, snorkeling underneath, you know, and I, 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 I see the world that is not human, and I see all of this life, and I'm a guest in that world, and I see how unbelievably magnificent it is. So I think that music is part of nature. I think that humans are part of nature. Cooking is part of nature. And, and if we think that, we actually will probably make different decisions. You know, it will make me buy things differently, maybe. Or maybe I will educate myself or my children differently. Well, my children are grown up, so I can't educate them anymore. Uh, but it's, but you know what I mean? It's like, it's, we, 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 if we actually just on a slight different pivot at a DNA level of thinking, that could have 
huge ramifications in the way we think about this. Plus, that can actually unite all of the human species. It's beyond politics. If we're part of nature, you know, politics, economics is something that we invented, but we're part of nature. And but that, you know, it it makes us think a little differently about everything, who we are and where our home is. And we're in fact, maybe part of our home. Our home is planet earth and we should feel uh, comf comfortable and happy anywhere we are around the world. Uh, is the pastoral, yeah. is the, is the, is the Beethoven number six, one of the, is the soundtrack of nature itself? It's like, uh, it's, totally. it's one of the best symphonies that sends the message that in order to have a function in planet Earth, we need to be listening to the, to the streams, uh, to the birds, to the thunderstorms, to simple things in life, like, uh, like a shepherd who's playing his, his flute. It, it's, it, it's the ultimate symphony for for mother mother earth absolutely you 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 hit the nail on the head it's it's beethoven got his inspiration from walking in vienna in the woods and you have the the brook you have uh the birds the cuckoo you have the storm and then you have the celebration of the grandness of nature and it's all coded and it's it's probably the only piece that that beethoven wrote that has a definitive program to it you know it's it's sort of like it's not abstract it is totally about uh, the experience of nature so if i wasn't a cook i i would love i dedicated my life for theater performing plays if you weren't the greatest musician, cellist, what, what would you be if you had you know what? to be something else? I think, I think my greatest passion is probably people and trying to figure out who they are and why they do what they do, the good things and the bad things. Uh, but if I had to say, my nature is that of a waiter. I would be happy being a waiter and to serve. And, but a waiter in every sense. So I could be, you know, a teacher, but a waiter, I'm serving. I could be a musician, I'm a waiter. I could be a government official. I'm there to serve using what is there and trying to give the experience a great experience to the person or people that I'm serving. That's, you know, the waiter is to me still a very glorified image of someone that serves that actually can apply to all of us because the reason we look for truth, the reason we're trying to build trust in our professions in, in, in our, in our sectors, is so that we can best serve. I, I agree with you. Right. I, I think waiters, literally waiters, is one of the most underrated uh, professions because in so many ways nothing will happen without them because they do deliver happiness. Yes, in a restaurant, they make yeah. things happen, but seeing how you are using the metaphor of a waiter, of, of people that make sure that people receive receive respect, receive love, receives empathy. Uh, yes, I understand now, Jojo, why for you this is important. It's you, you making know, it's sure that we build longer tables, longer bridges, bringing people together and delivering respect and empathy every time. Yeah, you see, for me, you would be the maitre d' because I don't want... I don't want to be the top guy. I like to be the middle guy 
that is sort of going in between. But so if I were a waiter, I would want you to be the maitre d' because because you can you can organize. You need a different kind of knowledge to kind of make sure that the whole functioning of the organization is fluid, knowing a lot more than the waiter. The waiter has to know certain things, but the maitre d' has to know society and the working inner workings of things. I like to know enough so that I can serve, but I don't need to know everything, and I don't need to be the top guy. I think more than a waiter, you want to be the shepherd, like if you were in in the pastoral of Beethoven. Uh, shepherds, which I love to see because I make cheese in North Spain, and I spend a lot of time watching them. They let the flock, they let, they let the cows, they let the sheep roam freely, be happy, eating in every little piece of grass they may find up in the mountains. The shepherd is this leader that leads from behind, not from the front. And it's a leader that gives freedom to their people to be whatever they want to be. And only is trying to make sure they never get in trouble, keeping them. I lost you. Oh, uh, I lost hi. You. Up in the mountains, you were saying the shepherd goes. So I think what you want to be is a shepherd. Because sometimes everybody, everybody has the role to be a shepherd and to lead. And I love shepherds, and I spend a lot of times in the mountains. I have I have a little company of cheese making in North Spain that I I help a couple of amazing talented cheese makers to make sure they were successful. And shepherds are very amazing people. Like shepherds, they don't impose what the flock, what the cows, what the sheep, what the goats do. They let them roam free in the mountain. They only make sure that they don't get into trouble and brings them to safety if there are thunderstorms. But I love sometimes to be like a shepherd. Yeah, he's in charge, but he doesn't impose what what the sheep and the lamb do. Let's them be safe, but lets them be happy and roam free. Uh, maybe in a way that's what, what Beethoven was trying to tell us. I think so. And I think you are you are a very good shepherd and 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 i i would be happy to be one of your flock <laughs> well my friend because let... that's that's the psalm you know the lord is my shepherd i shall not want so that to be part of your flock means that i'm going to be cared for and i will have a role you know it's like okay. we need good we need good shepherds and you're so let me tell you that then symphony number no. six is not only the perfect symphony to Mother Earth, but is the perfect symphony to feed the world. Why? Because without the love and care of that shepherd, we will not have the milk that is produced out of the goodness of the earth by eating the grass and the flowers. So the cheese makers of the world will not make the food that will feed the world. And you see, everything starts by a shepherd taking good care of yeah. its flock. That's, so, that's yeah. So now Beethoven was Sorry. bigger than nature. He came up with a soundtrack to feed the world. Well, yes, I would say, you know, I'd say. Uh, and you are playing it now, and you are letting all of us know, and we are all going to have to go tonight, tomorrow, put. Bring get the the trio that Jojo Ma has recorded, and just listen to the birds, listen to the streams, listen to the the shepherd and the thunderstorms, and just cook your life away, and let's feed the souls of the world, one plate of food at a time, one symphony at a time. Jose Andres, I have one. You are so eloquent. May I ask you to wait one minute while I go down three step, uh, uh, yep. three flights of stairs, and bring up my cello so I yes. can play something. Yes, for let's you do it right now. Okay. Just is that okay, guys? Yeah, is that all right? yeah. 
Chris. We only have one hour and 15 minutes. We're going to have to put into right. 40. Right. But Just it's going to be amazing. It's going it's to have to go through six fights. I wait, wait. My wife is here. And my daughter oh, wow. is here. So, people, okay. you saw what Jojo did. He went three floors down. He got his cello. Value at $2.5 million or more. And can you believe, as I told you at the beginning of this longer table segment, that he forgot his cello in a taxi cab? Only oh. Jojo Ma. Yeah. Thanks for divulging all my secrets. So this is for you, for uh, your family, because you started by mentioning a piece that you liked so much by this great Spanish composer, Ennio Morricone. <laughs> Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 Sorry, Ennio. Right. Forgive me. Forgive him. <laughs> I love Ennio. Okay. So, all right, here it is. This is the piece you like. <laughs> Bravo, bravo, bravo. That's your mission. I love your that. Mission. And we will go on until the mission is accomplished. Right? And the by mission, the way, with people like you, the mission will always be accomplished. 